Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Well, more beer for us, uh, a lot more beer. Um, Sean Porter beat Adrian Broner rather handily. David Lemieux took Hassan Endem's title, right, pretty convincingly, four knockdowns in that fight, and overwhelming favorite Andre Ward KO'd Paul Smith. Now understand, there'll be weeks where I'm on here and I, you know, will have to talk about an 0-3 week. So let's celebrate the 3-0 and week. It's been a good run for us. Now let's talk about Broner versus Porter because that really was the fight of the night. Now let me say this as an aside. You know, boxing really needs to police catch weights because now you have jokers using catch weights as part of a ploy to pretend to want to fight opponents, right? Um, here, the catch weight was so inauthentic. And for those who don't know, the catch weight here was 144. It was so inauthentic that understand Adrian Broner, who insisted on the catch weight, came in weighing 157 for the fight. Right? 157. I believe this catch weight was nothing more than a ploy to have the public believe that you were willing to fight Sean Porter. And then to have the fight fall apart because Porter, who fights at 147, couldn't make 144. Right? That's the only reason, in my opinion, just speculation on my part, but that's really the only reason to insist on an artificial catch weight. Understand, Broner himself had fought at 147 in the past. What was it about this fight and this opponent that made Broner want to ask for a 144-pound catch weight, right? It's a joke. Understand, too, they had a rehydration clause. I guess that's my phone. They, they actually had a rehydration clause in the contract, right? They threw it out. It was supposed to not allow either fighter to gain more than 10 pounds or so above the 144 catch weight. That rehydration clause was so bogus. Understand, both guys gained more than 10 pounds, right? They decided not to enforce the rehydration clause, right? They walked away from it. Neither would have been able to comply with that rehydration clause. So you, the fight fan, should be outraged. Guys now are using catch weights really for political purposes and image purposes. Right? This is an outrage. What I want are fans really, you know, the legacy media to start asking hard questions at these press conferences. To start to say things like, uh, excuse me, guys. Who asked for the catch weight? And then it turned to that fighter and say, you know what? You fought at 147 before. Why ask for a 144 catch weight? Right? Are you trying to fight your opponent at welterweight? Or are you trying to do something else here? Use a catch weight to rob your opponent of effectiveness or to have your opponent say, hey, I can't make 144. So you can then say to the press, I was willing to fight Sean Porter, but he turned me down. Now let me back up a little bit. Let me talk about someone dear to me, right? You know, loved my mom, had a great relationship with her. But while my dad would tell me things like, you know, I'd say, hey, dad, am I doing well? My dad would say, nah, Rich, you, you effed up this. Okay, okay, I can live with that. With my mom... You know, I could start a fire to the kitchen. I could burn down the house. And I'd say, Mom, am I doing all right? She'd say, yeah, yeah, you're doing fine. You know, I could hop in the car. I could crash the car. I'd say, hey, Mom, uh, you know, did I do okay? She'd say, yeah, you're doing fine. 
Now I know she wanted to encourage me. I know she wanted me to, you know, feel confident and, you know, let me know that she loved me. Okay, hey, that's all good. But you get older, you need real opinions, not political opinions. Right? You need to figure out how you're really doing. Right? You need not haters around you, but you need honest people around you. So when you burn down the kitchen, someone says, what's your ass doing burning down the kitchen? You messed up. Cut that out. You know, so when you bring home a report card that has an F on it, someone says, hey, this is not working. You know, you say, did I do good? The person should say, no, you didn't do good. Right? You're an A student, not an F student. Right? Figure that out. Now, let's be real about what's happening in the world of boxing. Right? Understand, these are young guys, teenagers, early 20s, in many cases, who are the breadwinners in their family. Right? I get the feeling a lot of these guys had parents like my mom where the guy's doing things that are a little bit awkward, maybe not developing parts of his game, and the people around him who love him are afraid to tell him. They're afraid to say, look, you know, son, I know you're doing well. I know you're now ranked. I know you're now on TV. I know you're fighting for titles. Maybe you're even wearing a belt, right? But no, you're not the best welterweight in history, right? No, your persona, which you believe is entertaining and endearing and charming, you know, quite frankly, is over the line. At times, it's boring. At times, it's boorish. Now, I have no doubt, none whatsoever, that the people around Adrian Broner love him, right? I've seen family members of his hop in the ring after fights and they really love him and I have no doubt Adrian Broner has come a long way right boxing was a dream for him he's developed his skills now he's a guy who's held several titles But what I really wonder about and I'm just being blunt here is whether anybody around him has told him that he doesn't have an offensive game backing up. Right? That he doesn't move well enough. That that flashy, good-looking persona in the ring where he has his feet spread wide apart and he's wearing, you know, white gloves and he's posing in the ring, that that might be ineffective against a guy who can move, a guy who's lighter on his feet, a guy who could invade his space. Ignore his persona, which basically says, hey, you don't want to come at me. Ignore his persona, who's unafraid of his persona, who can jump inside, invade his space, get him to start backing up, right, while throwing punches at him. That's the story of this fight. You know, no doubt Adrian Broner did a lot of training for this fight. He doesn't have much of an offensive game backing up. He just doesn't. Right? Sean Porter gets in, lighter a foot, can come in low. Right? You want to know what Adrian Broner did when Sean Porter got inside his wheelhouse and started forcing him to back up? Because Broner himself doesn't have the ability to back up and have an offensive game. Right? Broner just hugged him. That's what he did. Folks, a lot of holding in this fight. A lot of holding. Right? Sean Porter shows up, raises the temperature in the room. Adrian Broner then starts holding him. Now, this wasn't Kell Brook type holding because Kell Brook's actually offensive for parts of his fight against Sean Porter. Now, this was a guy holding for survival. Right? Because we knew Adrian Broner wasn't going to while backing up throw clever punches that wasn't happening right he doesn't have that in his game he's so accustomed to having a wide stance you being afraid of him and then moving forward and cornering you he's so accustomed to being on his front foot 
that when Porter dared him to be on his back foot, he had no answers. Folks, I mean, no answers. He has a good short uppercut that he throws when you back him up against the ropes. Okay, fine. But what he can't do is kind of like move along the ropes. Think Ali Liston, the rematch. Right? The phantom punch. Right? He's not a guy who you're on your front foot. You're going to hunt him down. And understand, Porter's sudden. Porter's not lumbering around like Sonny Liston. No, he's outside. Then he jumps inside. He's back here. Then he's up here. Right? When he comes in up here and catches... And Adrian Broner by surprise because Porter at times is leading with power shots, right? He's not shooting a jab to give a guy a warning. So when Porter jumps inside, Broner isn't the kind of guy who could then take a step back, throw combinations, take a step back, throw combinations, pivot, turn to the side, throw combinations. No, what Adrian Broner did was he just held him. Right? Just held him. Broner's volume dropped. Understand Broner, and let's be blunt, because I don't buy the entire narrative in boxing. Broner doesn't have Kell Brooks offensive arsenal. Right? Kell Brook, let's be blunt here. Kelbrook hits harder than Adrian Broner. Kelbrook is two-handed. Right? And I mean two-handed in a big way, not an occasional right uppercut. No, I mean two-handed in a big way. Right? Kelbrook than Adrian Broner. And so understand Broner here, his volume drops. The punches he lands aren't big punches. Sean Porter isn't just beating him. He's dominating him. Let's talk about the 12th round. 12th round opens. Sean Porter decides to take a book, uh, take a page out of the Sergio Martinez playbook from his fight against Chavez Jr. Right, he comes in a little lackadaisical. He's standing in front of Adrian Broner. Somehow he's not protecting himself from Broner's left hook. Broner lands it. Sean Porter goes down. There's a gasp. You wonder if Adrian Broner is going to come back and get a stoppage in a fight in which he's been dominated. Right? I know this sounds hard. The reason it sounds hard is the people who've controlled the boxing narrative have been fans of Adrian Broner. Let's be blunt here. When Sean Porter gets up off the canvas, right, maybe over the next 10 seconds, there's some question. But after that 10 second period passes, it's Sean Porter who eventually is on his front foot. Sean Porter goes back to doing exactly the stuff that he was doing before. Right? That 12th round that you're going to hear a lot of stuff about isn't an overwhelming Adrian Broner round. It's not like Sean Porter gets up and is staggering around the ring. No, he gets up and he goes right back to forcing Broner to try to show some offense on his back foot, which Broner can't do. Right? So if I'm Broner... I'm going to have to figure out a way to actually get the people who love me to give me real opinions, right? Even his persona is a bit ridiculous. You know, I know Ali talked a lot. Guess what, Broner? Ali did a lot more than you in the ring. Let's be, <laughs> let's be real here, right? Ali saying, hey, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. 
He's unbeaten until he faces Joe Frazier the first time, and that's after a significant amount of time spent out of the ring because of his opposition to the Vietnam War, right? And his, you know, uh, refusal to be drafted in that war, right? Understand, people in listening to Ali knew of the principled stand he took, right? Ali was in a special place. When Ali comes in, says, I'm the greatest, blah, 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 even when he gets personal a bit and starts calling Joe Fraser a gorilla before the fight in Manila, right? Even when he's doing stuff like that, understand, you know, people gave him a lot of latitude because they knew he was the unbeaten heavyweight champion and then he got stripped. Understand, Ali, when he was younger, was more controversial, right? Ring Magazine actually said the fighter of the year would have been Ali, but we don't like him, so we're not going to give it to him. I'm not kidding. Look it up online here, right? As he gets older, people, you know, laughed when he said, hey, I'm the greatest. But understand, people also knew he was a great fighter who had part of his prime, his late 20s, taken from him. Now, Broner doesn't have any narrative like that. Also, Broner crosses a line Ali would never cross. I'll tell you what. You know, Ali could call Joe Fraser a gorilla. Joe Fraser would get very upset. But if Ali showed up and actually started talking about how Joe Fraser's father had a finer woman than Joe Fraser and started dissing Joe Fraser's wife, Man, I'm telling you, not only would Joe Fraser want to get up and hit Ali at that press conference, and keep in mind, as it was, the guys almost skirmished on camera during an interview, right? But I'm telling you, a lot of guys on the podium would want to bitch slap Ali. That's over the line. Somehow, Broner thinks that's entertaining today. Somebody needs to sit this young man down, because he is a talent. He's just not the talent he thinks he is. Okay, so people need to stop saying, hey, Adrian, we love you and stuff, and need to start saying, look, Adrian, you know I'm your boy. You know I've had your back from day one. Look, man, player, you need to slow the roll here, right? Stop telling fans how much they want to have your picture, right? And start telling fans about what you're going to do to develop offensive skills on your back foot. Let's talk about David Lemieux. Folks, this is a bad man. This guy is just what I said in the pre-fight video. He's one of the hardest punchers in the entire sport. He's also lighter on his feet, much lighter than Adrian Broner. He has a big left hook. Endem never figures out the left hook. Right? Gets drilled, gets dropped. At least three of the four knockdowns are off big left hooks, right? Here are the problems with Lemieux. Some of these are structural. He hides his head a lot better than he used to, but understand he's a hunter. He's not the hunted, right? His head's not on a swivel, right? He's a little bit stiff net. The other thing is, like Adrian Broner, this guy is so accustomed to operating on his front foot that he really doesn't have that much of a back foot offensive game, right? You'll find this with hunters, right? You know, where's the fight where Gennady Golovkin gets hunted down and actually has to flash hand speed while backing up? Same problem with David Lemieux. The other thing, too, is Lemieux is savvy. He's a slugger who stays far enough away from you where you can't hit him with the jab. But when you come forward on him, he just goes straight back. Right? He, you know, it's the kind of thing where a savvy fighter, it happened already, the Marco Antonio Rubio fight, can do foot feints. Have Lemieux wondering if you're coming forward. Then jump in and might be able to catch him. As it was, though, this guy's a major player. 
He's a puncher's puncher at 160 pounds, right? I think this guy is very savvy. This guy, for one of the knockdowns, I thought it was beautiful, right? Endem figures out that the left hook's bothering him. He's already been knocked down by it. So Lemieux, who's very creative, he's very creative. Lemieux comes in, throws the left hand to the body, right? So you see Andem get hit with it. And you see Andem then drop his hand, right, to the spot where he's just been hurt. And Lemieux pulls that left hand back and hits him in the head with it, right? In other words, this guy's not just a left-right, left-right guy. This guy's mixing it up. Keep in mind, too, Lemieux's left hand was lethal this fight. I'm telling you, he also has a very lethal right hand. More importantly, he has a share of the middleweight title. I take him today over Andy Lee. I thought Doug Fisher does a phenomenal job in analyzing this fight during the telecast, right? And Fisher makes the point that Lemieux is different than Peter Quillen. Quillen is a big guy who should be fighting at 168, who's squeezing his body into 160, right? He has a big punch in part due to his size, right? David Lemieux, by contrast, is a puncher. Right, Lemieux's not as big as Peter Quillen, but Lemieux might hit harder than Quillen. Right, Lemieux knows how to get his weight behind his punches. As for Endem, let me say this. He's a mover. He's very light on his feet. He'll do well against sluggers who don't move as well as Lemieux. But you knew, because Lemieux, like Kell Brook, has foot speed, you knew that Endem would have trouble avoiding Lemieux's shots, because Lemieux was going to get up on him, and Endem is not defensively blessed up close. In other words, Adrian Broner is pretty good defensively in the pocket, not necessarily when a guy pot shots him from far outside. Right? Endem is the opposite. He's moving. It's hard to hit him from far outside. But when you get close and you start playing chess with him, curiously, he can be hit with shots like a left hook. So Endem's going to have to really go back to the drawing board here. He's gold against slower footed opponents. He has problems against guys who could move, as well as David Lemieux. Let me end in talking about the Andre Ward fight. Now, let me say this. One, I didn't like the 172-pound catch weight. If Andre is going to come up to light heavy, he needs to come up to light heavy. As it was, he fought a cruiserweight yesterday, right? Because Paul Smith wasn't serious about making any weight, right? Paul Smith blows the weigh in by four pounds. Then... The parties work with the California State Athletic Commission. They say, okay, you know what? It's good as long as he, you know, he'll pay a penalty, but we won't penalize him further as long as he's within this weight range, right? As long as he's no more than this weight, the day of the fight. And, of course, Paul Smith then blows that weight by a significant amount. Paul Smith ends up paying money both to Andre Ward and to the California State Athletic Commission. Now, if you look up Paul Smith's history, you're going to find that he's never been close to fighting at this weight before ever in his life. And so my point is simply this. You knew with Paul Smith's extra weight and his lack of experience with this extra weight and the fact that he's fighting a master boxer in that boxer's backyard and this fight was in Oakland, right? You know, where Andre Ward is king, right? You knew immediately as a gambler that Paul Smith was either there for one of two reasons. 
If it went his way, he was hoping to win by KO. Right? The extra weight might give him extra pop. Might allow him to bully a guy who he knew was going to weigh in at 172 or less because Andre Ward is the consummate professional and that was the weight at which they agreed upon. So if it went Paul Smith's way, you knew Paul Smith would win by KO. If it went Andre Ward's way, you understood with this extra weight, there was no way Paul Smith was going to make it 12 rounds, especially when Andre Ward is back with a surgically repaired right. Now, folks, Andre Ward looked bigger and hit harder than I've ever seen Andre Ward hit in his life, right? Everyone's calling me. I don't know, you know. Um, seems like I get calls during videos for some reason. Anyway, Andre Ward has an explosive right hand, and it's straight. And you need to know about it because he may not have had it when his hand was injured, when you last saw him, if you didn't see this fight, right? He blows up the left side of Paul Smith's face. In other words, the side of Paul Smith's face across from Andre Ward's straight right hand is what blows up in this fight. Let me point out, too, that Paul Smith fights a little bit too upright. I didn't see him throw many body punches. He really can't defend his body, right? He's a guy who's in there really off punching power and ruggedness, right? He had his guard high to protect his face. It allowed Andre Ward to go to town on his body, right? Andre Ward gets him bloody. Paul Smith's corner throws in the towel. I'm not kidding. That's how bad... That's how bad the beating was, right? Ward's going to be a major player at 175 if he stops fooling around with catch weights and actually joins the division. Let me say, though, I have the same concerns about Andre Ward that I had about Kell Brook before he fought JoJo Dan, right? In fact, after he fought JoJo Dan. Andre Ward fights this fight predominantly flat-footed. Since Paul Smith isn't a guy who has a lot of lateral movement, Andre Ward doesn't have a lot of lateral movement here. I get the feeling Ward entered the ring knowing that Smith weighed more than he had ever weighed in his life and wasn't going to have the stamina to go 12 rounds. So Andre Ward makes this a bit of a shootout. I didn't see the kind of lateral movement that I'd need to see. If he were to fight, let's say, a Jean Pascal and a Donna Stevenson, right? You know, <laughs> a Sergei Kovalev, right? Here, he was able to have a guy, the perfect comeback fight, right? Against a guy who's a slugger, who's a little bit upright, who's not there to dance, who's not there to move around the ring, who's not going to be confused with Hassan Endo, right? Paul Smith. You know, his legs are a little bit, you know, stiff, right? So, since this is Andre's first fight in more than a year, right, gamblers need to, you know, understand that right now the information you have is a bit incomplete. We know Andre hits harder than ever, and he does. That right hand, trust me, it's better than his left hand, and his left hand's awfully good. Deck Chad Daw Dawson several times, right? This version of Andre Ward, if he were to fight Carl Frotch, the fight wouldn't be close, right? Frotch might get stopped in that fight. Understand, Andre Ward today likely hits harder than George Groves. I'm not kidding, right? I'm not kidding, right? Andre now is much more of a puncher than you remember him to be because he was fighting injured. He had a rotator cuff problem, right? Just Google everything I'm saying here, right? So, Ward is back. His right hand is back big, right? In fact, his right hand is better than it's ever been, at least to my knowledge, 
right? The question I have, though, is whether Andre at light heavy still has the mobility that he had at 168. The jury's out on that because he wasn't required to use mobility in this fight. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. If you feel that I've been hating on Broner or whatever, and you want to set the record straight, if you feel that I'm not hard enough on Adrian Broner, and you want to point that out, if you feel that Sean Porter deserves more or less credit, that David Lemieux has better defense than I'm letting on here, right? That Paul Smith came in four pounds overweight by accident and then messed up on the second weigh-in by accident, right? If you want to take issue with anything I've said, then I hope you leave those comments in the comment section to this video, right? Congratulations on 3-0 and weekend. Um, let me say this too. So much late money came in on Adrian Broner believe it or not, that when the fight started, he was the favorite at the MGM Grand. That just shows you, and I'm serious about it, that just shows you how big-time gamblers can be wrong, right? The one thing I've learned in life is to trust your own eyes, even when the public sees a fight differently. This fight seems to have had everything in Broner's favor in terms of the criteria, right? 144 catch weight, right? Ridiculous. You know the rest. Then the actual fight happened. And you saw style-wise, it wasn't close. Let me say this too. Floyd Mayweather, the, one of the promoters on this fight, if not the promoter on this fight, uh, was there at the press conference in which Broner crosses the line, you know, says, oh, he's my friend. By the way, friend, your woman's not fine enough, and, you know, your daddy's taking all your money. That's how ridiculous Broner is. Well, anyway, um, I noticed Mayweather was looking hard at Sean Porter. Now, Mayweather has told us that his last fight's going to be against someone solid. Now, I'm telling you, as sketchy as Amir Khan looked against Chris Algieri, Right? And he did look sketchy in that fight. I still think American style gives Floyd all he can handle. Let me say Sean Porter would give Floyd all he can handle because at this point in their careers, right, Sean Porter's legs are better than Floyd Mayweather's legs. Now, I'll agree the one issue that would have to happen, what Porter would have to study is how Pacquiao's front foot game was so negated by Mayweather, right? Porter is explosive where he likes to be outside, then he likes to jump inside. That works against Adrian Broner, right? Against Floyd Mayweather, let's just say that hasn't worked yet for any opponent, right? So just consider the possibility since Porter just fought, Porter just beat Broner. Right? The fans cheered Porter in that fight. Understand, people understand Porter is rapidly developing a fan base. Right? Don't dismiss the possibility, especially since Miguel Cotto is fighting Canelo and his dance card is filled. Right? And Floyd wants to go out with a bang. Don't dismiss the possibility of Mayweather against Sean Porter. Anyway, let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. If Mayweather were to fight Sean Porter, right before I say anything about that fight, why don't you tell me what you think about that possibility, about who would win and why? Hope you leave it here in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.